Welcome to the shop. I'm continuing to produce parts for the Inquala. This is production run four, and I have 750 parts to make. So I think I better get going. In the past, in the, in the previous videos, I've showed the setup in fairly extreme detail. And I don't want to make these videos too long and repetitive and boring, so I'm going to probably leave out a lot of the setup details, leave out a lot of the stuff loading the tool carousel and zeroing the, uh, the machine. I'll probably just speed this up and get it over with and get to making parts, so. I'm using a known trusted tooling plate and a known trusted tool path. The vast majority of this production run is going to be designs that I've used before, tool paths that I've used before, pretty much without modification. Occasionally, as the project goes along, I'll optimize the tool path, maybe reduce cycle time, but the Anquellas that I'm making now are almost identical to the previous run. I made, I think, two small uh, changes that I'll be uh, documenting in greater detail in future videos, and we'll be describing exactly why the changes were made, but f mostly these are exactly identical to the previous ones. All of the previous tooling plates will be used, all of the previous tool path will be used, and all of the previous setup sheets will be consulted. And as you saw, if you're watching, as I showed in one of the earlier videos, sometimes the setup sheets can be wrong and confusing and leave out important stuff. So every time I do one of these, I try to make the tool path a little better, the setup sheet a little better, uh, and, and just improve every time I do it. So the blank here, one and three quarter by 6.3138 Once again, using 6061 aluminum extrusion, cold cutting chop saw with a carbide blade designed for let me check that dimension, yes. Measure twice, cut once. Double check, triple check, check again, check the check. setting the zeros here, Z0. Let me get a paper towel. Whenever I use a tooling plate, I almost always, except in very, very special situations, almost always use the top of the tooling plate as the Z0 reference point. Um, of course, that being said, there's always exceptions to every rule, but in most cases, I set the Z0 on the top of the tooling plate. Also, in most cases, I set the Z0 on the top of the blank when, I'm, when the blank is in the vise.
The machine does not like bumping the tool setter during a rapid feed operation. It ended up failing with an error message, so... <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Okay, so now I've got my work offsets properly set. Just to very quickly review, work offset 1, G54, 0 on top of the blank, 0 at the left rear corner of the soft jaws with the part sitting on the ledge. Work offset 3, top of the t zero on top of the tooling plate with uh, XY zero at the left corner and rear corner of the ledge on the uh, soft jaws. So let's load up the file here. This is also a known trusted program, but like all known trusted programs, I'm going to treat it as if it was a new program. And need to remove some tools that I'm not using because the the tool carousel is only holds 10 tools and the last part I made pretty much filled the tool carousel so I'm gonna just fast forward through the tool change operation it's not that interesting So now, I've got the tools all loaded up, got the tool path ready. I believe it's correct. It ran correctly first time that it was done. It, the, <laughs> it, let, me, let me get that uh, again. It ran correctly the last time it was used, the last time I made parts. And just to quickly review what's going on, first operation is done is, is drilling holes in the blank, drilling and tapping holes in the blank with the blank held in the right vise. Second operation is milling the profile with the part held on top of a tooling plate. Then the third and fourth operations are a little trickier because they involve drilling holes perpendicular in the ends, in both ends of the part, and that's going to require a special setup with special tall soft jaws so that the alignment is correct at the reference edge at the top of the part when the part is rotated. So let's go through the standard setup here for or the standard preliminary examination and observation when a program is being run for the first time after not being run. And as I said before, memory can be faulty. Single block. Verify pre-feed is reasonable. The toolpath program puts in a rapid to about an inch above the surface and when I'm single stepping I can stop it there and verify if I see it continuing beyond that one inch. I've got my finger on the stop button and in most cases I can usually get the thing stopped before it causes problems. So on to the feed uh, Z height, and yes, that looks correct. I believe I'm going to have success. Drilling with a fast pack to try to keep the chips under control. So, this is a reamed hole. This is a hole for the pressed in bronze bushing. Gonna check. Prefeed correct. Okay. 
Going to be reaming at 250 RPM for the pushed in, the pressed in bronze bushing. I'm using a nominal size 716 reamer, and the bronze bushings are a couple of thou oversized, and it results in a really nice, uh, strong press fit. Um, I don't want my bronze bushings coming out, so a press fit is good. Single step, verify pre-feed height, verify feed height, drilling with uh, 1500 RPM here, and I think I actually changed my half inch bit speed on the other part. Um, this is producing very nice controlled chips. The slower speed and more aggressive feed produces a thicker chip as opposed to a longer, thinner, stringier chip. And I think the, the thicker chips really do work better. The uh, tool bit comes out completely clean. I may change that other program to the lower speed because I think I like the, the way these chips are looking a little bit more. Oh, look at that. Once again, small mistake, nothing serious. Didn't the, uh, when I load up a program, the system shows me what tools are required and then I go to a different screen and load up the tool changer and sometimes, sometimes I make a mistake, but if this is the worst mistake I make today, hey, I'm doing good. This is putting on the decorative chamfer and it doesn't look right. These decorative chamfers have always been a slightly annoying situation. I'm going to go check, I'm going to ru continue running the program and then go check the toolpath to make sure that I've got this one with the same parameters as the other one that was looking very nice. Pre-feed correct, feed correct. 5140 RPM, full machine speed. This is the tap drill for an 832 hole, also running a fast peck cycle at 60 thousandths per peck. And 10 inches per minute feed. So the next operation is gonna be a, a power tapping operation. And Verify that the pre-feed height is correct. Verify that the feed height looks correct. And then I'm gonna apply some Tap Magic cutting fluid. The Tap Magic works really, really well in aluminum, Tap Magic for aluminum. And help it along a little bit. The, the spiral tap ejects the chips out of the, uh, at the top, and it clears the chips pretty well, but I kind of get a little bit careful with the air nozzle. So I'm gonna go into the uh, CAD room and, oh, Gonna make sure this tool is loaded up.
Yeah. That looks a little nicer. This, this part, I'm only going to put the decorative chamfer on the top surface since the bottom surface is pretty much hidden from view. I'm going to cut another blank. I really like having the, the deburring wheel right next to the mill. When I started, I did my deburring of the blanks with a file, and the scotch Bright just does it so much faster. So I'm going to go over here and run a complete cycle, because I believe that now the toolpath has been verified, all is well. I'm gonna do a little hand deburring. Now, I could have deburred that part with the machine idle and then put it on the tooling plate for the second operation, but that would be wasting time. So what I do, I make two parts with first operation, and then it, when the next blank is loaded into the vise, this one's already deburred, I can put it on the tooling plate, take that one off, deburr it while the machine is running, and it speeds up things a little bit. Once again, relatively slow 1500 RPM spindle speed and a fairly aggressive 10 inches per minute. And of course, all you guys with Serious machines are going to be laughing and going, 10 inches per minute? That's nothing, dude. But on the Tormach, it's a, a reasonably aggressive drilling uh, feed rate that I look over on my uh, spindle uh, power meter, and it's pretty much at the limit of what the spindle can do. But it makes short, thick chips that don't stick to the, the tool. Okay, let's see how this uh, revised chamfering operation works. And it works. It does not work. Okay. So it worked on the other program. Oh, so many ways to make mistakes, but fortunately this is an easily recoverable little problem. Got to be very careful when clearing chips off that tap that I don't blow them back down in the hole. I actually had a problem one time where I blew the chip into the hole and broke the tap. So. I'm going to go back in the CAD room and try to debug that tool path. 
nice having the capability of editing the toolpath on the controller. So now I've got a part that's been deburred and has all of its uh, first operation successful. I'm, gonna, I'm using a, a little aluminum washer there. because it's a it's a half inch socket screw and I don't want to ding up the aluminum surface in newer designs I'm usually switching to smaller screws because I don't really need the clamping force of a half inch socket screw and that amount of force actually can cause damage. So I'm switching to a quarter inch screw with a kind of a shoulder spacer. make sure that I got the correct G-code loaded. And so now this is the way production is going to proceed. First operation and second operation should just go one after another with only a stop in between to load parts. And meanwhile, do some hand deburring. Got a blank. I try to do as much as I can in parallel because always nice to get this Get this job done as quick as I can. See if I fixed my chamfering operation. That one's even worse than the other one. CNC machining can make you crazy.
Now the next step, this is a combo tool path that's constructed out of two different tool paths. And I've never run, or I shouldn't say I've never run, I haven't run the second half today, so I treat it like, treat it with suspicion. That looks reasonable. And well, that sure is getting coolant all over my keyboard. My spatter shield is pretty good, but not perfect. And that's looking like it's that's looking correct. One thing I have to be very careful of when designing fixturing and tool path, look how much those uh, screws protrude off the top of the part. I gotta be very be careful that I don't wrap it the cutter into one of those uh, socket screws because that would pretty much ruin the, the cutter. I'm doing three passes here with the Lakeshore Carbide Aluminum Shredder Roughing Cutter and I really like the, the aluminum shredder because it's a solid carbide roughing cutter with a serrated set of flutes, three, three serrated flutes, and it makes really, really small chips. And these small chips are very easy to evacuate with the flood coolant. This part geometry doesn't have a lot of uh, chip evacuation problems, but chip evacuation can be a real problem, and it's always nice to to make sure that the nozzles are adjusted correctly and I'm using the correct feed and speed and cutter geometry because if chips get caught, it'll break that cutter before you can react. Okay, coming now with the finishing pass. And as I said in other videos, even though the finishing pass takes a few extra seconds, I really like using the finishing pass because it, first of all, allows the roughing cutter to take all the abuse, to, to have all the wear, and second of all, it produces a really, really excellent surface finish. So, I'm gonna, I'm going to go in the CAD room and troubleshoot the toolpath, but I think that pretty much concludes uh, this section of the video. I'm going to turn the cameras off and then come back later when I have the tall jaws in place and show the third and fourth operations. So I'm back to uh, getting ready to do the uh, third and fourth operation on this part. I've, in a different video for a different part, I've already installed the tall jaws and set the appropriate zero using the Heimer indicator. In this operation, I need to be really careful that I have enough stick out so that I can get my hole in the right place. And I believe that I've got my reamer and the uh, slightly undersized drill bit set for the correct uh, stick out, but it's always a slightly uh, interesting operation when I have a stick out that's critical. So I'm going to go ahead and load up the program. I've Oh, in, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. 
I've already loaded the program and I preset all the tools in the tool carousel because watching me put tools in the tool carousel is pretty boring. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this cycle dry just to kind of have a bit of a sanity check here uh, because this is one of those where things can go wrong and a certainly don't want to booger up a couple of those parts at this stage after spending so much time and getting them made. So... turn off the coolant here and do my first level sanity check where I observe that yep things actually do look sane that does not look insane but I had a rapid down to to that point and let me make sure that's correct Well, I've got no spindle speed. So many things to keep track of. I had the, and this is the second time I've done this on video, so I had the spindle in manual mode for a different thing that I was doing off camera, so. That looks reasonable. And I believe that looked reasonable. It's interesting that for some reason in this toolpath, the uh, toolpath program didn't put in the uh, rapid to one inch above the feed surface. I don't know why it didn't put it in, but hey, looks like it looks like it's going to correctly drill my part. Now this is this part that I'm making, this, this hole that's going to be drilled perpendicular here, is a somewhat important hole because this forms the hinge where the, the twist magnet is put in place. And the distance between these two pieces and the position of the hole is fairly critical because you don't want a bunch of slop in that in this hinge because that would result in slop in the twist axis and so I ream these holes they're going to get a a quarter inch steel pin and I bet I could get away with just drilling but you know a little extra precision never hurts and so I'm going to ream this dude and I'm going to kind of hold my part over here just for eyeballic sanity check. And I actually, I should have done that. Let me go back and retry again because like I said before, I don't want to booger up these parts. And this is, you know, some of the operations that I do, I'm a little more, I don't take quite as much meticulous care, but operations like this where I have a feed much lower than the 
top surface down to a, an inner surface, and then uh, where stick out is important, really try to be extra careful. Okay. Getting more confident all the time. The part has two 832 blind tapped holes. And it also looks like it doesn't have the one inch pre-feed. For some reason, the toolpath program didn't put it in, maybe because of how tall the part is. But Okay, so it looks like it passed the sanity check, and I'm reasonably confident that things are going to work correctly. So I'm going to put a part in, turn the, uh, turn the coolant back on. And see if it actually actually works correctly. All is well. And all is well. So now I'm going to drill the the holes for the 832 blind tapping operation. When I'm doing a blind hole, I always drill a little bit longer than absolutely necessary. I want to make absolutely sure that I don't have a problem with tap breakage. These holes it need to be fairly precise and perpendicular. And even though I said in previous videos that I have a good eye for perpendicular, it's good for, for some things, but when I really care, I use machine tapping or hand tapping with a tap guide. So that is looking pretty good. I think I'm going to add to the G code a little Y move at the end. And
flip it. And no, I'm not going to sing a little bit of that song every time I flip the part. Flip it good. <laughs> If you didn't watch the video before, you wouldn't even know what I was talking about. So here we go again. The toolpath is now tested and proven. Everything seems to be working. Just going to go ahead, do the production run. Turn off the camera. When they're all done, they go in the vibratory finisher. And little bit by little bit, making progress. 750 parts. I'm doing the some of the harder ones, the, the more challenging special ones that take a little longer. I'm doing those first. There's a few of them that are so simple, I can just bang them out in just minutes. But I usually start with the more challenging ones and then finish up with the more trivial ones. So thanks for watching. It's been fun. Mm -hmm.